want to talk about what I think is the world's most perfect animal. This is not a big charismatic animal like humpback whales or grizzly bears. It's not a powerful, intense, scary predator like killer whales or wolves, if you're scared of those, or peregrine falcons, if you just want to be amazed. But at least from a human standpoint, if not a whole lot more, this animal is far more significant than any or all of those others put together. I'm talking about, of course, the salmon. And as you all know, the salmon are now coming as they do every summer here in Alaska. And we're about to witness one of the greatest events in the living world. Salmon thronging into the bays and inlets, into the lakes and sloughs, into the rivers and creeks. Everywhere around us, all along Alaska's huge convoluted 30,000 miles of coastline. Millions and millions of salmon, Carl Sagan, thank you. Uh, like living stars, swarming as they are, toward us from the dark universe of the ocean. Salmon coming into all these streams and rivers along the coast of Alaska, from Fish Creek and the Cot Lake way down in the southernmost part of southeast Alaska against the Canadian border. The Stikine River, the Taku River, the Chilkoot River, and farther north, the Setuk, and still farther north, swarming up into the rivers of Prince William Sound, along Cook Inlet and the Katmai and Kenai, all these rivers. I wrote down some of their names because they're so cool. The Nanilchik, the Susitna, the Copper River, and then way up to the north, the Nushagak, the Mulchatna, the Kuskokwim, the Yukon, those great rivers, and clear up to the Arctic, the Utalkuk River, the Kugaroak River, and the Sagavognektulk River, which is the easternmost of all the Arctic rivers. Again, we're back to the Canadian border. These river names, they shape our vision of Alaska's beauty. Ooh, I don't like that. Of Alaska's beauty and wildness. Um, and they speak to us, of course, about the richness that are, that's brought to us by the salmon. Now, the ancestors of the first salmon first came into existence probably in northern Europe, somewhere between 50 and 100 million years ago. The modern species of salmon go back about four to six million years. Think about that. How incomparably older that is than our own species. The earliest Homo sapiens, maybe 200,000 years ago or so. A split second in time. We are an infant species compared to the salmon around us right now. In Alaska today, as you know, we have all five species of salmon. We've got the pink salmon, or humpies as we call them, around here, the chum salmon, or dogs, the silver salmon, or cohos, the red salmon, or sockeye, and the kings are the chinook salmon. I've always wondered about those multiple names. Maybe it's just that one name simply is not enough for something as remarkable as salmon. Well, whatever you call them, there's no question that salmon are unlike anything else on earth. I can't think of a single community in Alaska, maybe there is one, I can't come up with it, that doesn't have salmon somewhere, somewhere nearby or basically right in the backyard or the front yard. For most of the villages and towns in Alaska, salmon are a key element in the cultural traditions and the subsistence life of people and often in the, in the cash economy. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game is, is creating a catalog of salmon streams. Well, it's anadromous streams, mostly that salmon, fish that come from, from the sea into fresh water. So far, they've cataloged 
17,000 anadromous waters where, where these fish live so far. They expect to get another 20,000. So we're talking about somewhere in the vicinity of 50,000 waterways where salmon are found in Alaska. I think about those waterways as something like a human body with all of our, our arteries, like the big rivers, our veins, like the smaller rivers and streams, and then there's the capillaries, the little bitty streams, and the ones that we never think about unless we get out and look around and we see these tiny little gutters of water running off the rivers, and if you go there at the right time of the year, which is coming up very soon in this part of the world, salmon are in there. The salmon are in water that doesn't cover their backs in water this deep, and little streams that at their widest point are like this. The salmon are in there. If there's water, somehow salmon manage to find it, and that's where they spawn and bring on the next generation. Of course, speaking of that, the most famous thing about salmon is their incredible life history. What kind of an animal is this anyway? Every salmon is born into fresh water. We all know that. In the stream somewhere it hatches in the gravel or maybe in a, along a lakeside for some of the species. Every species of salmon, when it's young, it shelters it feeds, it grows in a different part of that freshwater habitat. They're not all mixed together, the pinks and the chums and the cohos and the sockeyes and the kings. They're there, perhaps, in many streams together, but they use little different parts of it so that they, they can coexist without competing in the same water. What an incredible thing. What a highly perfected design that is for diversity in these species of animals. Now... The time that each kind of salmon spends in the river, that's also extremely complex and variable. Some species or populations stay for only a few months. Some stay for several years. Variability everywhere. And then, of course, they move downstream. They go into the estuaries. They make an adaptation, and they move out into salt water. And they swim far out into the ocean. There's much more food out there in the ocean than they ever could have gotten if they'd stayed in the streams. So out they go into the great gyres and the cold currents of the North Pacific and the Bering Sea to grow into their adulthood. And again, they're highly variable in how long they stay in the ocean. It may be just a year. It may only be six months. It may be six or seven years. Different species and different populations have different schedules. You can't even think about salmon without thinking about this kind of variability. And then, of course, comes one of the world's great miracles of navigation. As salmon from far out there in the ocean start to make their way back to the place where they were born. And some of them take that very literally, like the sockeye salmon. So... So the, the sockeye salmon, Steve was telling me, who's a fishery biologist, um, often come to the very same patch of gravel or sand where they were born. So literally back to their birthplace. Some other ones, Steve said, wander more, like the pinks and the chums, may stray off to a different stream. But they do make their way back very close to home. How do they do it, swimming for a thousand miles or more in the ocean? Well... Recent discoveries, magnetic cells in some kinds of fish that are presumed to exist in salmon. Perhaps there's a sensitivity to polarized light from the sun. And I think many scientists agree that when they get closer to their home stream, they use their sense of smell. And I keep kind of thinking about this. How does a salmon smell? I don't associate smell with water. But anyway, they, they do this. They have some kind of chemical sensitivities. Here's an interesting thing. Salmon coming up the Yukon River. There's, there's two great divides, the Yukon and the Tanana. Around the town of Galena, the village of Galena, 200 miles below the confluence of the Yukon and the Tanana, those salmon have already picked the side of the river. 
some following the north bank to stay in the Yukon, some the south bank to follow the Tanana. What incredible, enticing, fascinating mysteries. And I, for one, hope we never figure it out. <laughs> We've got to have mysteries in the world. So some of these salmon, as you probably know, spawn just to right at the edge of saltwater and freshwater. Some of them go miles up toward the headwaters to stream, some to, to spawn, and some go tremendous distances. The longest migrating king salmon in the Yukon River, up around 2,000 miles from saltwater to their spawning place. Every aspect of the behavior and physiology is somehow genetically programmed for distance to, to adapt to the distance to the, to the spawning grounds in the summertime. This is one of the many, many ways that salmon uh, in each run and each population are genetically distinct from all others, finely tuned to the particular circumstances of their own home waters. This bewilderingly complex genetic diversity is a key to the success of salmon. They're highly adapted to their conditions. Another remarkable thing, of course, every salmon dies after spawning. Bringing, as you probably know, those nutrients from the far reaches of the ocean into these veins and arteries and capillaries of the land, depositing those nutrients for the bears, the wolves, the otters, the mink, the gulls, the eagles, and the many, over, way over 100 species of animals that make use of them in this part of the world. They also get all the way up, those nutrients from the ocean, all the way up to the tops of the tallest trees. Nutrients that started way out there in the ocean. Trees along salmon streams may grow faster and bigger than those away from the streams, helped along by those ocean nutrients. It's not just the animals that are moving the nutrients from the stream bed up into the woods, as you've seen if you've looked around in Alaska. It's not just that, but also something called the hyporheic flow, the flow of the water under the gravels of the stream and out under the forest, unseen. You wouldn't even suspect. You think this is the stream, but in fact the stream may be, may be much bigger than you think. Well, salmon have undoubtedly helped to sustain human beings for a long time since the very first people crossed the Bering Strait. We know from this history in Alaska that salmon runs can be amazingly resilient. You can hammer them and they'll come back as long as you take care of the rivers and the lakes where they spawn and as long as you take care of the surrounding environment, keep it intact and undamaged. Now the history along the rest of the Pacific and Atlantic coast shows us that salmon runs can get in a lot of trouble in a big hurry. Dams, logging, agriculture, urban development, salmon farming, Many runs of all five species have been depleted or have disappeared in California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. According to biologists, some of those same processes that have damaged salmon outside of Alaska are beginning to happen here or are proposed for here. Logging in the Tongass National Forest, damaged hundreds of streams now being repaired by the Forest Service to the extent that they can. The Susitna Dam up near Anchorage, 885 feet, the biggest dam in the Western Hemisphere if it's built under proposal right now in the headwaters of the Susitna River where five species, all of them, spawn. The Pebble Mine, a huge deposit of gold and copper and, and molybdenum, would be a, an open pit mine apparently if it's, if it's developed at the headwaters of one of the biggest salmon river systems in the world, the largest sockeye salmon runs and the most valuable ones anywhere on earth. Supporters say jobs and money. Opponents say minerals inevitably run out. If you treat salmon right, they will last literally forever and bring food and money into your community as long as you keep on going and take care of them. It's as if the forces of the universe created salmon to show us true perfection. To put salmon on earth here, to amaze us, to challenge the human mind, to bring glory into our lives, and above all, to teach us, to teach us 
through life and death synchronized in our streams, how the whole living process works, and why we have to take care of it if we want it to keep going, perpetuating whole communities of animals and people as well. The beauty and complexity of salmon is far beyond anything that humans have ever created. They make our computers look simple and elementary. It's a testament to what the natural world can do if it's given millions of years to work with it. By comparison, we are the rankest of beginners. <laughs> Where, as a young Koyukon man once said to me, you're smart but not wise. It was probably the most important thing anyone ever said to me. He was 16 years old at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure if he was smart or wise or maybe just a smart ass, but whatever he was. <laughs> whatever it is, certainly we're smart enough to harness enough power to snuff out in the blink of an eye what took millions of years to perfect. But are we wise enough to leave the infinitely greater genius of nature intact? Are we wise enough to protect the waters that salmon need in order to continue? Are we wise enough to consider the fact that each of us that eats salmon also brings those nutrients from the sea into ourselves? This room is full of those nutrients right now. Happy people full of salmon nutrients from the sea. <laughs> So we are exactly like the bears and the otters and the bald eagles and the gulls. Exactly like that. And we're exactly like those trees with nutrients from the sea, way up in the highest tips of the boughs. Exactly like that. We are no different from that. We are salmon walking around on two legs. We are salmon speaking and singing about salmon. We are salmon looking at salmon themselves. And so by protecting the salmon... Are we not then also protecting ourselves? Are we not also then saying that we have a place in our life for absolute miraculous perfection? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.